This is Bill Farmer again. Welcome back to McMaster University course, Computer Science 1JC3, Introduction to Computational Thinking. Today we're going to be starting a new topic called data. So let me remind you of some of the most basic things we've talked about in this course so far. It's what, com what computers do. So computers store and manipulate information. And this information is represented by various kinds of data. And then the behavior of the computer, how it stores and manipulates this data in particular, is controlled by algorithms. And these algorithms are implemented by programs. In just a few sentences, that pretty well sums up what computers are what they do. So you see, information is represented by various kinds of data, and we're going to talk about that today. So there are various kinds of data, numerical data, documents, digital images, digital audio, digital video, and data that's been organized for queries. This is the kind of data you find in databases. Now, we've talked a lot about uh, numerical data, and I think you've probably had a fair amount of experience with documents. So we're going to focus on the other kinds of data. So let's start with digital images. So a di a digital images are images that are captured and stored digitally. That means essentially they're stored as a sequence of zeros and ones. So a digital display, as you can see on the computer display, it consists of a rectangular grid of pixels. So each pixel is a point in the grid, and this point basically holds a bit of color. So the resolution of the display is the grid dimensions, and the higher the resolution, the more detailed the image because the more pixels you have and each pixel is assigned a color. So that's what a digital display is. Now raster graphics is a way of representing an image as a grid of pixels. So it's closely related to the actual digital display that's displaying an image. So the finer the grid, the greater the resolution. And the more bits per color, the truer the truer the color. And raster images contain a huge number of bits. Uh, they require a lot of space, so they're usually compressed to save space. And there's um, several different formats to do this. So that's what a raster graphics is, is where you're capturing an image as a grid of pixels. Now, vector graphics is much different. Here, you're going to represent an image as a graphical, or the, I should say, geometric object in some coordinate system. So for instance, if I was going to represent, if I had a coordinate system, I was going to represent a circle. Basically, all I need to know is I need to know the center of the circle and the radius. And with those two pieces of information and my my grid, I, I, know, I, I know everything I need to know about that circle, and you can see the amount of information I need is very smaller. For this, so for this reason, vector images are usually smaller than raster images, and they're also used for representing scalable images. So if I want to make this circle bigger, all I have to do is change the radius. If I want to move it, all I have to do is change its center. So, so vector graphics are, are very convenient for some applications. Uh, they're less, application, less convenient for applications that require a complicated image, like an image of a picture of a, you know outdoors or a picture of a person, something like that. Okay, so here's a question about 
digital images. Um, how many bits are needed to represent an uncompressed 1000 by 800 resolution digital image with 24 bit color? So I'll give you a few minutes to think of this and then we'll come back. Okay, welcome back. So we have a digital image, which is a thousand by 800. That means there's a thousand by 800 pixels. Each pixel is a little point of light, a little point of color light, and we're devoting 24 bits to that color of light. So here's the right answer. That's how many bits it would take to represent such an image. Okay, so now let's talk about models for representing color. There's, there's two main categories of models. One is what we call an additive model, and the other is a subtractive model. Now, the most common additive model is the RGB model. R stands for red, G, green, B blue. And this is an this is an additive model. And this is a kind of model that's used for representing color on a monitor screen. So color is the sum of three colors, three colors of light, red, green, and blue. And the color is often represented as three eight-bit bytes and each 8-bit byte is represented by a base 16 digit. So I could have something like this. And these two digits represent red. These two digits represent green. And these two digits represent blue. And since we're talking about 8 bits, we're talking about 2 to the 8 bit possible colors, which is 256. So if we are putting these values here in base 10, we'd be we'd have values between 2 between 0 and 255. Okay, so with this kind of color scheme. The more red, the more green, the more blue we have, the brighter the color will be. And if we have maximum red, blue, and green, which if we represent that, maximum would be 255, which is FF, 255, FF, 255, FF. That would be maximum color, and that would be white. And if we have no color, which is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, that would be black, no color. And this is white. Okay, so this, this is the model that's used for displaying color on a, mon on a monitor. And it's an additive model because the color we get is the sum of these three colors. Okay, another model called CMYK C is for cayenne, M is for magenta, Y is for yellow, and B is for black. So this is a subtractive model. This model is, we, we're starting with uh, white light and we subtract from it to produce other colors. And if we subtract everything, then we get black. And these colors work this way. Cayenne, ink, well, I should say this, this model is often used for printing. And when you have a printer, you will have uh, four colors here. Cayenne, magenta, yellow, and black. Technically, or theoretically, you don't need black because if you use the other three core colors, you can get the effect of black, but the black won't be pure black often. So we add black to get very sharp black. Now, cayenne absorbs red. 
That means the red light is absorbed and the other light is reflected. So cayenne equals green and blue, so it absorbs red, it reflects green and blue. And magenta absorbs green, and magenta is equal to red plus blue. Um, notice that we have this uh, red, green, blue. So if we're absorbing green, what's left is red and blue, and yellow absorbs blue, and yellow equals red plus green. So this is a subtraction, subtractive model. We, we get color by absorbing light. The more light we absorb, the darker our color is going to be. Okay, so I have a question now. An R RGB color. Which of the following RGB color codes specifies the color of gray? So these are color codes where we have um, eight bits per color. Eight bits for red, eight bits for green, eight bits for blue. Okay, so I'll give you a moment. Think about this, then we'll come back. Okay, welcome back. So let's go through these colors. This color has an equal amount of red, equal amount of green, equal amount of blue. And when you have the same amounts of all these, you get some shade of gray. So this is gray. This is the answer. Um, if you have very little equal amounts of color, you're going to get a dark gray. If you have a lot of color, you're going to get a very light gray. Now, just this one has maximum red, minimum green and blue. So this is red. And this one has maximum red and maximum green. So this is yellow. And this one has maximum red, maximum green, maximum blue. So this is white. OK, so let's move on to something different. Digital audio. So digital audio is produced from a continuous sound wave. So you can imagine you have some kind of sound wave over time. And we're going to digitize it by periodically, you know, some fraction of a second, we do a test. And basically what we do is we find the value and so forth. And these values are just going to be numbers. And we record basically a stream of numbers. And if our period is very small, we're going to get a stream of numbers that's going to give us sound that's going to be, well, the, the smaller the period, the more uh, the more faithful our sound will be, or higher fidelity our sound will have to the true sound. So anyway, so this is done by sampling and quantization. Um, and when we do this, uh, sounds outside human perception are just eliminated. We don't worry about those. And the files that are produced, we have to reduce these to size uh, we can reduce these, the size of these without significantly reducing sound quality. So people have figured out how can we reduce the amount of information we need for the sound so that as far as humans are concerned, the sound quality stays the same. So there's a number of formats to do this. So this is how digital audio works. Uh, then there's digital video. Um, uh, with digital video, 
uh, we have a sequence of digital images. So we already talked about different ways you can have digital images. So we basically just produce a sequence of these. So each of these is an image. And we need about, about 30 frames per second. So 30 of these images we would have each second. And this would be what would happen at 1 30th of a second. So we could say 1 out of 30 and so forth. So we have 30 frames per second, 30 images per second. And so then a video file will be this stream of images plus there will be an audio stream or an audio track and then there will be metadata. So metadata, metadata is data about our video. It could be, there could be information about captions, about uh, what languages are being used, what kind of subtitles, uh, what the, you know, who developed it, who are the, who are the principal people who are involved in it, all kinds of different things. That can be metadata. And just like audio, the video and audio tracks, these can be compressed for storage and transmission, and they can be de decompressed later for playing. And again, there are a number of video formats. So I have another question for you. And this is a question about analog mediums, fully analog mediums. So an analog medium is, is really the opposite of a digital medium. An analog medium is something that's stored without numbers. Um, so the question is, which of the following can be captured by a fully analog medium? And your choices are sound, stationary visual image, moving visual image, or all of the above. Okay, so I'll give you a moment to think about that. Okay, welcome back. The answer is this, all of the above. All of these can be captured by analog media. Uh, sound, if you remember, um, before we had digital medium, sound was captured either by things like tape or like records. And as you know, when a record is created, um, the sounds are picked up, they vibrate a bit, and that cuts a groove in the record. And then when you play the record, how that groove is cut can be translated back into sound. Uh, a stationary visual image is basically just using photographic film. So you expose the film to light, that light puts an image on the film. And a moving visual image, the kind of movies that have been made for you know, the last 150 years or so, they are just a a set of images that are put on, well, basically it's a set of film images. So we have a piece of film and we put an image here and an image here. And then when we play this through, if there's enough images here, it looks like a moving image, but actually it's just a set of, it's just a tape of stationary images. So, so film is interesting uh, because in a sense it's it's a even though the medium is fully analog it is a mixture of analog and digital because this is each each of these is analog but it's set as a stream of images and so in that respect it is digital okay so we're going to stop right here and we will continue next time with, uh, we'll start off with files. Okay, well, thank you very much. See you next time.